This lecture, lecture 5, continues our exploration of ancient Greek art from the Dark Ages to the Hellenistic era. I have presented it from the start as a story of naturalism and idealism, and this lecture is certainly part of that story. In last week's class, we moved on specifically to archaic art, which dates to about 600 BC to 490 or 480 BC. I called this true archaic art because for historians, the archaic period is the entire period before classical art that begins after the Dark Ages, whereas for art historians, archaic is the period that follows geometric and orientalizing periods. We discussed the idea that during this period of true archaic art, there is a movement or progression towards greater naturalism which helps illustrate specific narratives from Greek history and legend, as well as personalize certain rituals. In the last class, we discussed how this was accomplished in the pictorial arts, primarily on vase painting. Today, we are turning to the plastic arts, or sculpture. It is here, more than in the 2D arts, that we can really trace the development of naturalism with regard to anatomical precision throughout the Archaic period. A starting point would be the Lady of Auxerre, which we viewed as an example of late orientalizing art, often called didalic. Look carefully at the statue of Menkauri and his wife from Old Kingdom Egypt, almost 2,000 years before the Archaic era in Greece. We have already discussed how Greek sculpture used Egyptian models as a point of departure for sculpture. However, we also observed that the Egyptian rendering of the human figure was more detailed and anatomically correct, even at a time much earlier. We noted that much more of the female body was revealed beneath the drapery, and we noted the very rigid, tight-fisted pose of the Egyptian male statue. This will certainly be directly passed on to Greek sculpture. As you can see here in the Kouros. Kouros is a general name for all nude male statues in the Archaic period. The plural is Koroi. The female counterpart is Kore, or Kori to use a more modern pronunciation. The plural of Kore is Korai. The Archaic Kouros here is a life size statue in Naxian marble. And the orientalizing core here is a limestone statue that is about two-thirds life-size. However, you may observe that the most significant difference between the two statues is the amount of dress they have. The koros is always depicted in the nude, whereas the core wears clothes. This is to pre preserve female modesty, while at the same time exalting the perfection of the male body. Nudity full nudity in monumental sculpture is one of the unique contributions of the ancient Greeks. The New York Koros, here at the Met, dates to about 590 to 580 BC and is among the earlier examples of its kind. By comparing the New York Koros to various ancient Egyptian examples, whether from the Old Kingdom or from a more contemporaneous period with archaic art, you may note a couple of things. First of all, Egyptian sculpture with regard to the standing pose has not evolved significantly in nearly 2,000 years. The overall appearance of the statues is one of rigidity. Although the stride is intended to give a sense of movement, which would bring a hint of life to the otherwise timeless and immutable statue, in some ways it actually reinforces the statue's immobility and rigidity, because the feet are positioned in a way that does not really lend itself to walking, but rather cementing oneself firmly on the ground because the feet are flat. I suggest trying the pose to see what it feels like and getting a true sense of what the artist has conveyed. Of course, it is worth repeating that it should also strike you how strongly Greek sculpture is indebted to these Egyptian prototypes. In its earliest stages, stone sculpture has achieved some advances over Old Kingdom stone sculpture. For example, the spaces between the limbs are almost entirely carved out, with the exception of some supporting marble between the hands and thighs, but the proportions of the Greek koros are not yet anatomically correct, and the rendering of the face is not only out of proportion, but also far more schematic and simplified. 
Why do you imagine the New York Coros is here compo compared to the Dipolon Crater? Both are at the Metropolitan Museum, sure, but they also have a similar purpose. Even though they are very different objects, they are both funerary monuments. The Kouros type could serve several purposes, and a grave marker was just one of them. It may also have been used to represent the god Apollo or other legendary Greek heroes, and it may have served as an offering to the gods. The Kouros shares these functions as a depiction of a deity or a votive figure with its female counterpart, the Kore. In its funerary function, the Kouros commemorates the deceased, who is depicted in an idealized form in a monument for all the ages. One of my goals for this section on archaic sculpture is to have you look closely at the art objects and to practice putting them into words, precise, or putting into words precisely what you see. It's a great exercise to do together in class, but we won't be doing it uh, with this one, I guess. These details allow you to observe some of the features of the early Kouros more closely. You can clearly see how the artist has schematized or simplified certain parts of the anatomy. Observe the lower legs. You see shin bones that have been carved almost to a point. Another common convention of the early archaic sculptor is replacing modeling of the figure, or in other words, the subtle rounding out of forms through carving, with mere lines. You can see in the calf muscles that line the lower legs. You can also see an emphasis on line rather than modeling, in the minimally carved ribcage and hips. As your focus moves to the torso, you will in fact note that the ribcage is rendered as more of an idea of a ribcage than something real and anatomically sound, for the shape is far too oversimplified, and the supposed ribcage is squished into a predetermined shape for the thorax and torso, rather than informing or creating those shapes. The articulation of the pelvis is not only too linear, but too steep and too straight. Like the early Ur, Lady of Auxerre, the New York Koros has a head that is oversized for the body and parts on the face that are too large. You will observe the gaping, almond-shaped eyes, the heavy eyebrows that form a perfect arch over the eye, and the stylized ornamental hair that follows to some degree the wig-like appearance of the Lady of Auxerre's hair. All in all, although the New York Coro dates to the Archaic period, he has much more in common with the late Orientalizing Didalic sculpture that we saw in the Lady of Auxerre. Archaic sculpture achieves such a great degree of naturalism in so few decades that it almost looks like two different periods. Here we see a somewhat more classic example of a Coros, the Coros of Anavasos, and a Core the Athenian peplos core from the later 500s. It should be noted that we often think of these sculptures as we see them in their later neoclassical counterparts. From the Renaissance forward, there has been little thought of covering gleaming white, carefully carved and polished sculpture with color. However, the Greeks, who were surrounded by native marble quarries of historic importance, actually painted their marble to bring their statues to life. You can see the traces of paint on both of these statues. The paint also makes it particularly clear that uncarved areas like the eyes would actually include all of the correct anatomical parts, that's to say iris, pupil, etc., in a painted form. But while we're looking at the face, I would like to draw your attention to one of the features of archaic sculpture that makes it immediately recognizable, the so-called archaic smile. Like the stride, it was probably intended to give the figures a sense of life. However, many students find that it gives the statues a frozen look. The famous Mona Lisa smile has been said to have a timeless hint of a, uh, an expression that recalls the archaic smile, um, but it's a kind of expressionless expression. Her eyes are what assert her psychological presence in da Vinci's painting. The still rather rigid poses of the Koroi and Korai instead enhance their fro frozen expressionlessness that the archaic smile gives them. A statue of a fallen warrior, which we will discuss later, has the same archaic smile as the Koroi, 
and the same nudity that makes him look like a reclining Kuros. Therefore, you can see that the expression is not indicative of a particular state of mind. Here is a closer look at the Anavasos Koros, side by side with the New York Koros. He dates to about 540 BC and is named for the town in Attica where he was found, Anavasos. I hope you remember that Attica is the region in which Athens is located as well. The Anavasos Koros at 6 feet 4 inches is at a slightly more human scale than the New York Koros, but it's still a heroic scale. He has the same stride, the same overall pose, but his musculature is more articulated and the modeling is smoother. The arms are in a slightly more relaxed pose, being bent further back at the elbow, and the hands are placed close enough to the thighs that the sculptor doesn't need to rely on struts or support marble filling in spaces between body and limb to keep the sculpture intact. The statue bears an inscription that read, Stand and mourn beside the marker of dead Croesus, whom, as a warrior, raging Ares destroyed. To parse that comment a bit, we are looking at a young man named Croesus, and of course this is an idealized version of a young man, rather than exact portrait likeness. The inscription makes clear that this is Croesus's funerary monument, thus confirming the interpretation that these statues immortalized youths who died young. Remember, one of the primary roles of male citizens, particularly young men, was to serve as warriors and fight in battle. There is a visual clue that lets us know he was a young man. Do you remember what it was from our discussion last week? Chrysos is beardless, as all Koroi are. Since the ancient Greeks did not shave, beards were a marker of age. It should be noted that youth was considered the most beautiful age, and Apollo, who was the most beautiful of male gods, is represented as beardless, eternally young, and splendid in appearance. Incidentally, you will note that Ares, the Greek war god, is a quote-unquote raging and destructive god. In Greece, much more so than in Rome, where he is known as Mars, Ares is a frightful figure, embodying the devastating effects of warfare. This slide compares the proportions of the earlier and later Koros' bodies. The parallel line shows where different parts of the body fall on the two images. The proportions of the Anabasos Koros are clearly more accurate with regard to reality, and the oversized head of the New York Koros is much more noticeable. In this slide, the dark blue lines are also parallel lines, while the lighter blue lines match body parts between the two statues and slant up or down. For example, you can see the top of the New York Koros's forehead is much higher than that of the Anabasos Koros, as are his eyes. The chest, however, is a bit lower and the hands hang lower as well. His knees are much higher, making his shins too long compared to his thighs. Please focus once again on a detailed anatomical comparison. We have noted that the New York Koros has anatomical parts that are literally delineated with lines. Overall, the visual lines are simpler, much straighter, and more geometric. The shin bone in the Anabasos Koros, on the other hand, is still slightly pronou highly pronounced, but has a more organic curvature. His legs have organic shapes matching human forms instead of the oversimplified ovoid, circular, and triangular shapes of his earlier counterpart. Look at the knees. You can draw a parallel line between the knees of the New York Koros. Forty years later, you'd have to draw a slanted figure eight kind of shape to connect the knees. Forms overlap. Although it's still a rather rigid pose, it's more natural with a greater sense of depth. Overall, the musculature of the Anabasos Koros is rounder, stronger, and more sensual. The nudity begins to suggest an ideal of male beauty that would endure for centuries. This detail reinforces those ideas now in the upper body. Overall, the arms and body itself into the thighs is rounder in the Anabasos Koros. The musculature, even before the classical era, is much more naturalistic. The rib cage starts to look like a skeletal structure within the thorax rather than like a line etched into a predetermined shape. The upside down U curve of the ribs is still not anatomically correct, but it's getting closer to something real. The abdomen has soft undulations that convey the underlying musculature. 
the hips and pelvis have more complicated curves instead of that simplified V shape we saw earlier. We have noted that the hands don't need struts, but the curves of the forearm conveniently follow the curves of the hips to gain support. Overall, despite the powerful musculature, there is an effect of youthful voluptuousness instead of Heraclean strength. The ideal is an athletic figure of grace and beauty. A back view actually highlights some of the schematic conventions of the earlier work while also revealing anatomical problems that have not quite been worked out in the later work. The New York Horos uses literally lines for the shoulder blades that again give an idea of shoulder blades rather than something anatomically accurate. The Anavasos Koros hasn't quite figured out the anatomy of the back either, although it does allow musculature to appear in more subtly swelling forms than in linear ones. You also see in the New York Koros the incredibly schematic depiction of the elbows, the area above the butt, uh, between the back and the butt actually, which actually doesn't have a linear break in real life and overly engaged tendons behind the knee. That stylized hair is like a flat board, even with the ribbon, whereas the hair on the analysis core starts to form a bell shape that responds to the shape of the head, shoulders, and back where it rests. The face and the top of the head also show a clear progression from stylized forms to more organic, natural ones, even though the archaic statues do not yet represent the culmination of naturalism that we will observe in the classical period. The archaic smile is clearly visible in the Anavisos Koros. It lacks emotion and offers no psychological penetration. The Koros type is common, but let's look at other types of male sculpture. The Rampan Rider dates to about 550 BC, just slightly before the Anavisos Koros. It was found on the Acropolis amongst the rubble that resulted from the Persian invasion of Athens in 480. The sculptures that were damaged during the sack of the city were buried in a ceremonious way when the city was rebuilt, and thanks to this they comprise some of the best preserved marble from the Archaic period. We'll discuss this Persian sack at the beginning of the Classical period. The Rampen writer depicts a mature male as identifiable by his beard, rather than the youthful Koros. The elaborate, jewel-like patterning of the hair is still very stylized and similar to what we saw in the Koroi, but he seems to be wearing a leafy crown rather than a fillet, whereas the Koroi are so frontal and rigid, this sculpture has an unusual turn of the head. However, it should be noted that he was excavated broken in pieces and the head, which is located in the Louvre, was associated with the body by an art historian later and so a cast was made of the head in order to reattach it to the body at the Acropolis Museum in Athens. If you look closely at the abs, you will note that they are largely delineated by lines under an upside-down U-form, which places them somewhere between the New York Koros, who has no ab muscles, but who typically uses lines to delineate skeletal muscular forms, and the Anavisos Koros, whose abs are rendered through subtle modeling. The Rampin rider, who was named after the French collector Georges Rampin, who acquired his head, is an equestrian statue. His identity remains unknown. Some scholars believe he is one of the legendary Greek heroes. Another theory suggests that he represents the winner of a race. If the later theory is correct, he would be wearing a crown of lovage leaves, which were given to winners of the Nemean Games and the Isthmian Games. The Moscophoros is another marble Koros like statue found in the rubble on the Acropolis. He dates to circa 550 BC, and his name means calf bearer in Greek. His rigid, striding pose is very similar to the Koros, but his lower arms are raised to support the calf on his shoulders, and he wears a cloak which is nonetheless very sheer and is open in front to uphold the convention of nudity. His head appears to be slightly tilted and he has the archaic smile and other simplified features about the head that date him to this time. His eyes would have been inlaid actually here with precious stones that are now lost rather than um, painted as the other Horoi's uh, eyes were. His beard, which is even longer than that of the Rampen Rider, particularizes his age. 
in many ways the presence of the calf, the simple gesture of holding another animal and connecting to it humanizes him a bit, but the scale does as well. He is not literally larger than life anymore as the Koroi were. As noted, the female sculpture is called a kore, and these can be much smaller than their male counterparts. About 3 feet 10 inches high, the Peplos kore dates to about 530 BC. She was also found in the Acropolis rubble, and so has the official name of Acropolis 679. She's a true masterpiece of archaic art with her beautifully preserved traces of paint on marble and the immediately identifiable archaic smile. Female statues were always clothed during the Archaic, and most of the subsequent periods as well. The particular dress she is wearing is called a peplos, which was made from a tube-like cut of cloth. A comparison to the orientalizing Lady of Auxerre indicates a similar type of progression towards increasing naturalism that we saw between the New York Koros and the later Anavasos Koros, although her robe still hides most features of the underlying body and there is a somewhat columnar expect aspect to her appearance as well, particularly below the waist. However, she has those clear, crisp, archaic forms that have moved beyond the disproportionate, almost geometrically simplified forms of the Lady of Auxerre, and she has much more subtler modeling as well. The hair is much more refined, falling sinuously along the curves of the model, rather than being blocked out in a single shape that looks like a heavy, unmoving wig. The highly frontal pose is still conventional, with one arm down by her side and the other raised. Here you can see some reconstructions in paint. Although in an earlier class I shared my thoughts about the quality of some of these reconstructions in general. The combination of these three images indicates just how conjectural the reconstructions can be. What you do note is that paint is used to augment the decorative patterns that are only lightly etched onto the statue. In fact, you could say that the paint is really what makes these patterns visible at all, and certainly creates a much different visual effect. You can also see that our historians remain unsure about who this figure is precisely. Keep in mind that we don't really have preserved cult statues from the earlier periods, but two types of sculpture works abounded since the Bronze Age, both with the religious context. The first are the aforementioned cult statues, which would be images of the goddesses um, and gods as well. The second are votive statues, which are figures that stand in for human beings and in a sense make a perpetual offering to the god or goddess of choice. With regard to the core eye of the archaic period, we should be thinking about specific attributes that could um, make them a goddess, whether the bow of Artemis that you see here, the pomegranate of Persephone, or the armor of Athena. The peplos core could be any of these, or more, but the core could also be a generic representation of a maiden, now embodying the ideal of female beauty rather than the generalized ideal of masculine beauty embodied by the Kuroi, even for specifically named warriors like Croesus. These generic maidens could be priestesses or attendants of the goddess, as well as stand-ins for a donor. We do have a statue that says, uh, Nicandre dedicated me to Artemis, thus a female dedicating to a female goddess, but it still doesn't reveal the exact nature of the statue itself. Acropolis 675, as she is elegantly called, uh, dates to about 520 to 500 BC and was also found on the Acropolis. Her clothing is very different from the Peplos Cores. She is wearing a chiton with a hymation draped over it, and these garments cling more tightly to her body, revealing the charming feminine forms beneath. A small statue with beautifully preserved traces of paint tending towards the cooler palette for a change she has been described as delicate, dainty, pretty, and elegant, and is truly one of the most beautiful examples of her type. Unlike the male nudes, this core offers the sculptor the occasion to delight in a variety of textures and various fabrics rather than just flesh and hair. Presumably, the arm down by her side clutched her drapery, where you can see it bunched at the side where her hand would be as if to lift the skirts from the ground which is a pictorial convention that developed for the Korai towards the end of this period and is seen in other statues. 
She has the pseudo-striding pose of the choroi rather than the straight-legged pose of the peplos chore and prototypes there uh, before that, such as the Lady of Auxerre. The Euthydikos chore, dating to about 480 BC, stands on the edge between the Archaic and Classical periods. An inscription reveals that she was dedicated by Euthydikos, a male, and thus suggests that dedicators are not necessarily always the ones represented in the dedicated statues. As noted, we don't really know what the Quarii represented, and making a connection with Athena just because she was on the Acropolis in Athens would be presumptuous. On the other hand, we can pretty fairly speculate that she was created at the very end of the Archaic period, just before the Persian sack of 480, because although she is a core in type and pose, <clears throat> and she was buried with the other rubble, she has a new spirit. What has changed? The archaic smile has disappeared, for one thing, and her face has a more neutral expression. The eyes don't have that slightly gaping quality of an incorporated a more fully modeled depiction of the eyelids. There is also a simplification of forms in many ways, especially in comparison to the richly textured fabric of Core 675. But the thin garment allows for much more exposure of the underlying body and its swelling very solid forms. All in all, she has a new sense of sobriety and consciousness that marks the transition to the classical era that we will soon be entering. Turning to architectural sculpture in the Archaic period, we should pause to review our architectural terms. We'll be looking at sculpture in temple pediments, metopes of the Doric friezes, and in continuous Ionic friezes. The Temple of Artemis at Corsaira, now called Corfu, features limestone sculptures on its west pediment dating to early in the Archaic period, circa 590 to 580. The pedimental scene depicts Medusa with leopards. You may be wondering why the monster Medusa is depicted on a temple, but she has a connection to the goddess Athena, who guided Perseus on his mission to defeat the Gorgons. And this is thus an image of heroism at the service of the gods. The gorgons and leopards are also guardians against evil. Medusa's swastika-like pose is a standard archaic convention, suggesting that she is running away. In fact, she's running away from Perseus. At the left end, we have preserved a seated figure who is about to be speared and another that has already fallen. On the right end, we have what has been interpreted as an image of Zeus with his thunderbolt fighting a giant, one of the common iconographical themes for ancient Greek temples. There seems to be a corpse in the corner behind them as well. Overall, the pediment does not present a unifying image, but rather a mixture of scales, certainly, and apparently of subjects as well. But such scenes gave way to narrative mythological scenes, just as in vase painting, and we see an increasing emphasis on the clear depiction of stories. <clears throat> the style of carving here is very much like that in the early Koroi and Korai, dating to around the same period. You can enjoy this frightening image of Mizu Medusa with her snaky hair and bared teeth, bound to frighten off unwanted ills. The Athenian treasury at Delphi features metopes dating to about 500 BC, at the opposite end of the Archaic period. Thirty metopes show the exploits of two heroes, Theseus and Heracles. Theseus we remember from his victory over the Minotaur, and Heracles we know as the strong man whose many adventures included the Twelve Labors. The central image here shows Heracles in one of those labors, specifically Heracles and the Hind. It has a crisp definition of forms. The interesting composition is circular rather than paratactic, meaning uh, putting the two figures side by side. Theseus <clears throat> and Antiope, shown here at left and in a detail at right, has an unusually free modeling that looks forward to early classical approaches to carving the figure. The composition is pretty relaxed here too. Although the figures of this time have the ever-present archaic smile, the tilted heads give figures a certain ethos or sense of character. It makes the interaction more psychological, less cardboard. The Siphnian treasury, dedicated at Delphi by the city-state and Aegean island of Siphnos, dates to around 525 BC. 
It serves as a kind of culmination of archaic sculpture. The building entrance features caryatids, which are sculpted figures that take the place of a column and essentially bear the weight of the entablature on their heads. They are maidens associated with the goddess Artemis as Artemis Caryatis. It features two painted marble pediments and a continuous frieze, which makes it Doric or icon Ionic. Ionic, of course. The subjects on each of the four sides of the frieze are different. The North Frieze, which depicts the Battle of Gods and Giants, and the East Frieze, which depicts the assembly of seated gods in the Battle of Greeks and Trojans, share similar stylistic traits and look more advanced than the South and West sides. Since everything was painted, even marble architectural elements, there is a question of whether painters and sculptors were the same. Overall, decorating a building is certainly a very large project, and there were likely several hands at work here. The North Frieze of the Siphnian Treasury, again depicting the Battle of Gods and Giants, is one of the more impressive sections of the frieze and is carved in high relief with highly rounded forms and three-quarter views. The Lion Attack recalls depictions of a similar subject in other times or cultures. You can compare it with the Mycenaean lion hunting scene on the far right, and two Assyrian reliefs of lion hunts from Nineveh dating to about a century before this. The position of the lion's head is certainly very similar, suggesting that the Greeks had probably borrowed a pictorial convention at some point, as had been true for many motifs in the orientalizing period. The Temple of Aphia, Adagina, an island off the coast of Athens, features some even later architectural sculpture. In fact, the pediments were created at a transitional moment just before the classical period. Although late in the period, these are the best preserved of all the archaic pediments. The temple itself was rebuilt in 500 after a fire that completely destroyed an earlier archaic temple dating to about 570 BC. The pediment sculptures are carved entirely in the famous Parian marble, a flawless white marble from the Aegean island of Paros. And remember that these would be brightly painted. The illustrations you see here are simplistic color reconstructions of both pediments. The west pediment, dating to about 490 BC and seen on top, is still purely <coughs> archaic. The east pediment, dating to about a decade later on a stylistic basis, is already transitioning to the early classical. This discrepancy remains unexplained by scholars. Both pediments feature Athena as the central character, although the temple is dedicated to Aphia, a local goddess of fertility and agricultural cycles dating back to Mycenaean times. Aphia was essentially subsumed by Athena and other more prominent hegemonic goddesses. Athena, like the other Olympian gods, was intimately involved in the Trojan War, and so both pediments depict battles between the Greeks and the Trojans. Here you can see the parts of the pediments that actually remain. They are housed in a museum in Munich, Germany. The Athena from the west pediment is much better preserved. You can see her entire figure here rather than just uh, basically her head and part of her feet. The Athena from the west pediment shows the typical archaic smile and looks like a core. The drapery is crisp and simple. Her pose is rigid, and there's no interaction between her and the other figures. Her shield even seems to separate her from the combatants on her left. Less of Athena from the East Pediment is preserved, but she's closer to the Euthydikos Core. There's perhaps a trace of the archaic smile, rather than the sort of pout that appears on classical sculpture, but she has attained that early classical sobriety. The tilt of her head and the remains of a raised arm indicate that she has um, <clears throat> that she had, when she was intact, a much more active pose, probably striding with her hand held aloft. She's involved in the combat rather than appearing as a frontal, rigid, iconic figure. Another shift in style can be made by comparing the archer from the earlier west and the later east pediments. The archer on the west looks much more posed, although there is an emphasis on contour that results in a rather beautiful, sinuous line. The archer on the west is wearing Persian dress to suggest foreignness. 
And in fact, by this time, the Persians had occupied all of Anatolia, including the city of Troy, and they were engaged in a major conflict with the Greeks. Contemporary events are not illustrated by the Greeks at this time, but there certainly is a kind of transference between myth and actual life. The archer on the east, identified as Heracles due to his lion skin helmet, is in Greek garb. The sculptor has added more anatomical detail, showing bulging muscles and infusing the figure with a sense of tension. You can fully sense the weight of his body as he pulls back the arrow. He looks actively engaged in battle, whereas his counterpart on the west, Pediment, looks much more weightless, like he could spring up, like he could spring up almost like a graceful elf or something. The fallen warriors on the ends of the pediment also appear quite differently. The fallen warrior west on top looks more like a recumbent Kuros. The archaic smile is strongly chiseled on his face, even though he has an arrow piercing his chest. The overall effect is somewhat false, as the combination of his facial expression and his pose suggests that he is posing for a camera, rather than dying in battle. The fallen warrior on the east gives a much different effect. It's true that those same traces of an archaic smile typical of the transitional time remain, but he is clearly suffering from his wound. As with the archer, his body conveys a sense of weight. Gravity is pulling him to the ground, and he struggles to get back up. You can see how he uses the shield to prop his body up against the forces of gravity. Unlike his counterpart on the west, he seems to have his hand on the hilt of the sword, rather than the arrow that has inflicted its mortal wound. All of this adds up to something new. There is a sense of pathos, which is a feeling of pity, sympathy, or sorrow, or perhaps all three combined, on the part of the viewer. And this sense of pathos that the viewer feels is attained by imbuing the sculpture with a believable sense of pain and suffering. There is also a sense of ethos, which is character, and this ethos is attained by imbuing him with a sense of pride and vulnerability as he struggles and yet fails to get up. There is a great nobility of effort in these moments before death overcomes him. It is the combined forces of pathos and ethos that form a great change in the art at the opening of a new era, the classical era. Combat scenes like this one allow the sculptor to depict action scenes in a fully three-dimensional way. But we'll have to wait until next lecture to hear much more about the classical era, including the famous conflict between the Greeks and the Persians that really opened this period historically, while the stylistic changes happened as well.